<laughs> I want to thank you for joining us today for a Bible study. I know I kind of look like I'm in a very dark place here compared to our, our board behind me. I know that kind of washes me out a little bit. We're going to do the best that we can. Technology, unfortunately, is kind of a limitation right now as far as being able to place this on the board, my being able to write on the screen, you being able to see me. I hope you can tolerate this a little bit tonight. Uh, let's just begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for our continued study of Paul's books, in particular the book of Ephesians today. During the season of Lent, this is an incredibly important lesson because it reminds me of the hopefulness that we have in Jesus Christ. For it is his precious name we pray. Amen. Now I know we are in this season of Lent, but you will notice that all the lessons that we do are really uplifting and powerful, in particular when we get into the epistle lessons in Paul's books, they're meant to lift us up. We always think of uh, the season of Lent as this really depressing time and oh, woe's me and how off I am. That is not the purpose of Lent. The purpose of Lent is to give you hopefulness as to why Jesus Christ and the cross is so important. We don't live in the hopefulness of that very first Christmas day. We live in the hopefulness of the day of resurrection. And so if Jesus were born just to be a little baby boy, well, good for us, but there are millions of baby boys born every single day in poor towns to poor parents, who cares? Most of us don't. But the fact that this baby boy came to die and also rose again for our sake is what makes this season so important why we set aside this 40 days. And so you notice our lesson, it's kind of a jumbled mess. And it's kind of like the lesson that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. I gave you a big screen, which you're welcome to, in this case, download again. This is posted to the advertisement for today's service. And this is just kind of a rough draft of what I want to try to communicate to you tonight. You notice there's all these little colors and all these little marks. The problem that we have with Greek when we read something in Greek, there are all these dependent clauses and phrases that refer back to words that happened earlier in the sentence. And, you know, these things are just oftentimes one sentence in Greek. And so this word depends upon this word. It's one of the reasons why uh, when you have a friend or maybe you're one of those folks that says, oh, I want to pull out, uh, I want to pull out the concordance and look up a word. How does the Bible use the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? Well, it doesn't, by the way. But we'll say that's the word, and you want to look at what, what it means and create your systematic theology around that word. The problem is that word is not always meaning the exact same thing depending upon the context. Now, that's true in English. If I use a word like that, how am I using it? Am I using it sarcastically? Oh, supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Or am I using that as hopefulness? Oh, XB, uh, supercalifragilistic expialidocious. Yay! How am I using it? What is my context? It doesn't always mean the same thing. That's true with every word. So it can be the exact same word. What is the context? How is it used? You can't just look up a word and assume that the Bible means the same thing every time it uses that exact same word. There are different authors, different intentions, different contexts, different references to which that word is referring back to. This is what we run into in the book of Ephesians. You're going to see how complex Paul's arguments can get here. So, we start with this phrase, and you were dead in your offenses. Well, that's kind of a very... Lenten type of thing. Your offenses and sins. So that's meant to be parallel. The word offenses and sins are meant to be parallel. But notice how I've got a little curvy line here. And I put a little bracket around this verse 2. That's my doing, by the way, that curvy line in that bracket. Because that is being developed, this word offenses and sin is being developed by what's within the bracket. And that's why I have that bracket there. So that's what it's referring to. Now, if you were to take verse 2 and just learn it as a memory verse, well, that would be bad. Why would it be bad? Because it's dependent upon this concept that came before. So you're dead 
in your offenses, in your sins, in your sins, the sins in which you previously walked. So you walked in those sins. You see how verse 2 doesn't make any sense if you don't have that word sins. Now we have these type of dependent clauses in English as well. But you gotta understand this is one verse and it gets really complex and he has one word, that, a phrase that refers back to another word and then he develops another word with another phrase and another word with another phrase. So let's again start here. What sins? The sins in which you had previously walked. Oh, wait a minute. Now he's going to flesh out that word walked. Okay? That word walked. How did you walk in it? You walked according to the course of this world. You previously walked in these sins according to the prince of the power of the air. So you see I've got a number one and a number two. That's developing that previously walked. You walked in those sins according to the course of the world. In other words, in the way everybody else did. This is just life. We're sinful creatures. We've fallen away from our relationship with God. We've walked according to the prince of the power of the air. To whom is referring? Well, probably Satan, right? The evil one. We follow Satan. Satan doesn't make us follow him. This isn't Satan's world, but we give our hearts to Satan, to those things that are not of God. And so that's the way we have walked according to the prince of the power of the air, the way he would have us walk. The spirit, again, that word spirit, power of the air, that spirit, referring back to this prince again, that is now a work of the sons of disobedience. Who are the sons of disobedience? All of us. Who follow something other than God. Okay, so that's the clause. This clause, see, so you have a clause within a clause, Right? This whole clause develops that word sins, and this walk is developed by prince, okay? About walking, accord, uh, walking according to these two things. And the prince is developed by what follows that. So he's got all these dependent little things. He's developing each one of these words separately. And that's why this verse doesn't make sense unless you can figure out to what is he referring back to. Now, so we're, we're dead in our offenses. That's the concept in our sins. Now, take a look at verse 3. This one, out of context, just doesn't make sense. Among them. Among what? Among what? What, what is Paul telling us here? Among them. Now, notice that I put in parentheses here something that is not in the Bible. That is my, that's why I put it in italics. So you understand that that phrase develops something different. Among them, the power of the air, among that, we too previously lived. Okay, we lived as these type of sons of disobedience, uh, obedient to the prince of the power of the air. We lived in that. We're no different. We can't have our noses in the air and think we're somehow better. So we previously lived in that. How did we live in that? Notice again, this phrase, this word lived is now going to be developed. How did we live in that? We lived in that when we lived in the lusts of our flesh. Now there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with our bodies. You know, sometimes we think of this being carnal knowledge or, or sex. Well, you know, there is absolutely nothing wrong with sex in the appropriate context with a man or woman or whomever God has called you to love, okay, in the context of that marriage, in that relationship. That's fantastic. But the lust of our flesh refers more to sexual or carnal desires. This is referring to those desires that make us, our bosses, our gods, our own little kingdoms and fiefdoms and powers when we seek materialistic things as opposed to the things of God. We are living according to our lusts. Okay? So we previously lived and walked and obeyed the powers of the air because we lived in our lusts of our flesh. And also, we indulged the flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind. 
okay? So the things we gave into, those things our mind told us. You know, it's not a bad thing. You know, sometimes we think of some things we maybe, as a man, you know, men oftentimes will look at a woman and say, oh, she's really pretty. Well, okay, that, that's not lust. We give into that lust. We betray our spouses. We pursue that lust. That's what he's talking about. Or those desires. It's okay to want a million dollars. There's nothing wrong with wanting a million dollars. But if you give into that and you do evil things in order to accomplish that or things that hurt other people, you're giving into that. So we go on. What's the third thing? We lived how? By the nature of children of wrath, as did everybody else. We're vengeful, hateful. Boy, don't you see that going on today? People have just given themselves over to such angst and anger and hatred towards each other. We take our vengeance out upon everybody else. We always forget that we're part of the problem too. So this is how we've lived, okay? This is who we are. So we were dead in our sins. So do you see how we developed that whole thing and how all this is related to each other? But then he goes on and introduces this. But, this is a contrast. This word but, that's a really an important word. He's creating a contrast for us. But, this is not what God's intention is for us. God has a different plan for us. Do you see how that, that stark break, this is the way it has been for us, but God has something better. But God, again, God in red, because God is the most, this is the most important figure in the Bible. Also the most unpredictable figure in the Bible. So what is God going to do? Well, look at how many things I've got. One, two, three, four, five different things God does. One, God, who is rich in mercy. Why? Because of his great love. See, now these things actually kind of develop who God is. Who is God? God is the one who is rich in mercy. God is the one who has such great love for us. Okay, who else is God? God is the one who made us alive together with Christ. And who else is God? Number four, God is the one who raised us up with him. Who is God? Number five, the one who has seated us with him in the heavenly places. God is the prime mover of life. God is the actor. And so if you get this impression that you're going to heaven because you're a good person, take a look at what God has done. This is what Paul's point is. Five different things that God has done that you have absolutely nothing to do with. It's something God has done for you. Because who are you? You are the person who lived in your offenses and sins. You didn't improve your life. You didn't go to the, the Christian self-help group called the church and all of a sudden become a good person. You can't make yourself that way. This is something that God has done for you. Who's God? The one who's rich in mercy. The one who loves us. The one who made us alive. The one who raised us up with him. The one who seated us with him in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ. We are at the table with Jesus Christ. We are his best friends. He loves us so much that he wants to feast with us. How amazing is that? Now the big question is, why does he do this for us? We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. Why? So that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. Why? Because God is just motivated by kindness and love. <laughs> Isn't this cool? But it's so complex. You have to figure out the references that Paul, how he's, these words refer one word back to another, back to another, back to another, and he's making a very complex argument. But here's the point. We get to verse 8. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. You didn't do it. Who's the prime mover? God is. Well, actually, God is the only mover. The only movement that we've made is to sin and create offense. Despite our sin, despite our offense, the prime mover, God 
has created a way for us that we might have relationship with him. So it is by grace we're saved through faith. Now he develops the word faith. Faith means that it's not of yourself. You didn't do it. You didn't create it. And two, it's the free gift of God. So there's a result of this. What's the result? Because we have a relationship with God based upon what God has done for us, because God is the prime mover, here's the result. We are God's workmanship. God made us. We are a piece of clay. God made us into a beautiful piece of pottery. God saw this beautiful piece of wood and sculpted and, and knocked out of it all the excess wood and, and made something beautiful, a statue out of it that's gorgeous and beautiful. This is what God has done. You are God's workmanship. You are God's beautiful creation. The work of the creator. The, you're his handiwork. And why, why did God make you? Well, it's like any piece of art. Any piece of art ultimately shows the skill of the one who created it. All of these things God did so that you might demonstrate the artistic ability of the God who made you. You are his workmanship. You're created for good works. Your good works demonstrate the beautiful workmanship of God. Do you notice again, these works don't get you to heaven. They don't make you a great person. You're not a great person. You're, you lived in your sins and offenses. You're no better than anybody else. But God has taken that clay, that log, whatever you want to see yourself, and made you something beautiful. So we might be a reflection of the love of God. I hope this is unleashed for you how beautiful a passage this is. It is. But sometimes we read this passage and we only read these little phrases. We have to understand all of these phrases develop another phrase. And another that phrase is developed by another phrase. And then Paul loops back and finally comes to his conclusion. This is a very complex argument. But let me finish with this. In the end, it's very simple. We don't get to heaven because we're good people. Despite the fact that we aren't good people, God sees something beautiful that could be made of us. And so God, like any great artist, takes this raw piece, this unfinished piece, you and me, and makes something beautiful of us. <laughs> That's great. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, what a gorgeous lesson this is. And we just give you thanks that Paul, as complex and difficult as writings may be, that you communicated through Paul the life-giving words, the salvation we have in Jesus Christ. So God, we look up, we lift our heads up to the heavens above and realize that our salvation comes from you. And we are so grateful. Help us to be a beautiful masterpiece, a reflection of your love. For he asks this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I hope you continue having a wondrous Lenten journey. And I look forward to seeing you on Easter. Amen.